once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Dr. Norman Deutsch, who is a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and the New York Times best-selling author of The Brain That Changes Itself, which was chosen by the Dana Foundation from over 30,000 titles. It's the best general book on the brain. He is on the research faculty for the Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research at Columbia University's Department of Psychiatry in New York City, and on the faculty of the University of Toronto's Department of Psychiatry. He lives in Toronto, and the book is kind of a sequel to The Brain That Changes Itself. This book is called The Brain's Way of Healing, Remarkable Discoveries and Recoveries from the Frontiers of Neuroplasticity. Dr. Deutsch, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. This is exciting, and I want to do a couple of general questions and then get into the, the fascinating stories of healing that, that are in here. Um, the first thing is, uh, I wonder if this book is for the general public. I mean, a lot of us know someone who's had neurological damage or dealing with chronic pain or is headed towards old age when more problems exist, uh, because it has a scientific bent to it. Yeah. Um, Basically, my specialty is writing both for the general public and for professionals at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's something of interest to to both therapists, because there are new cutting-edge things there, but I took eight years to write it to make it crystal clear uh, to anyone. Um, It's possible to do that, by the way, because when you write about new things in science, um, you're you're not using jargon. Mm -hmm. There's there's a change in the paradigm that's happening here. We're going from having thought of the brain as being like a machine that was hardwired to one that actually can be changed. And so we can use the same language in speaking to the general public and to professionals. And that's great. And and that's part of the beauty of this read, I think. Um, I was fascinated because, you know, as I grow older, I worry about these things. And I also grew up in the 60s when they told us if a part of the brain is damaged, you just lose out. There's there's no hope. And uh, we're seeing different uh, uh, discoveries with the the. What what one reviewer called a tidal shift in basic science that you're talking about here? Yeah, um, it, it it is a tidal shift. Um, you know, if I could just say, you know, the word neuroplasticity in the subtitle because it's, it's it's these are recoveries from the frontiers of neuroplasticity. That's a big word. Neuro is for neuron, the nerve cells in the brain, uh, and the nervous system, and plasticity means changeable, modifiable, and adaptable, mm-hmm. and Neuroplasticity is that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and its function in response to activity. What we do with our, in the course of our everyday lives changes brain structure, and mental experience can change brain structure. Not all brain structure all the time, but we had this view that the brain was like an electrical machine that was hardwired, and it turns out that, that not only is that wrong, it's actually spectacularly wrong because the way you learn, develop skills, or even respond to injury is to form new circuits and strengthen or weaken connections between existing circuits. So your brain is actually, um, I mean, to use a metaphor, it's its not like a hardwired machine. It's more like uh, there's a bunch of musicians around, and sometimes they'll do pickup jazz and Sometimes the trumpet player will actually work in the local symphony as well, Mm -hmm. you know, or in the marching band. Um, Neurons can link with certain neurons to form circuits and then link with other neurons to form other circuits. And this creates the opportunity for us to, first of all, strengthen neurons with activity or strengthen circuits with activity and reform circuits if some parts of the brain have been damaged. Mm-hmm. And that's the fascinating thing that, that you tell about in, in a number of anecdotal situations, uh, although there's a lot of research going on and has been for years in Russia and uh, and even the, the spiritual practices in the East from, from meditation to judo have been a part of this. But let's start with neurons 101. A neuron has three parts, the dendrites, the cell body, and the axon. Let's talk about how those uh, work together. Sure. So the cell body is where the DNA is, and it maintains the life and the infrastructure of the neuron. The dendrites are, are, look like tree branches, and they take incoming signals, pass them uh, along a kind of cable-like thing to, to the cell body, and then along a long cable 
to other neurons, and that long cable is called the axon. So they've got an input area, a life uh, infrastructure area, and then an output area. And they all hook up to, They can uh, a neuron can be attached to many, many, many uh, other neurons. So it's very, um, it, it can be processing lots and lots of input at once, and then it can be sending output to, uh, to various places. Mm -hmm. And when it gets enough input, uh, electrical, chemical input from other neurons, it can fire a big signal. And we've tended to say that neurons are either on or off, meaning they're firing or not firing. And this, But this isn't quite right when you look at groups of neurons, if I can just take a moment on that. And mm -hmm. if, if I can explain it, readers will understand why it's possible to do much more healing than we thought. We used to think that if a person had a stroke and lost 90% of the use of their right leg, um, that it must have meant that 90% of the neurons involved in processing movement in the brain were either dead or those long cables were cut in some way. And that's why they lost so much function. And that's because we thought neurons were kind of like on or off. Okay, we have to distinguish two things. The only time neurons are never firing any signals is when they're dead. Mm -hmm. But in terms of on or off, when they're in the so-called off position, it's not that they're firing nothing. They're just fire, firing slow signals most of the time. And when they're on, they're firing fast signals. So they go from beep, 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 to beep, 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 beep that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, when there is brain damage or some kind of brain disease, and this includes many, many kinds of brain disease, not just one or two. Some neurons may be dead. Some neurons that were, were receiving signals from those dead neurons are suddenly kind of like non-functioning, dormant offline for a while. So they're under-functioning. Some neurons are sick. They may not have been killed, but they're firing at irregular rates creating a lot of noise in the brain. Mm -hmm. And other neurons are healthy, but they're getting input from those noisy neurons. So you put all of this together, and after a stroke or various kinds of brain, brain diseases, including certain kinds of learning disorders, Parkinson's, aspects of depression, multiple sclerosis, stroke, traumatic brain injury, what you really have is a noisy brain that's out that's poorly synchronized and not nearly as many dead cells as people thought and in this book i describe ways of resynchronizing the noisy brain it's as though we thought that in the brain there's only one thing if the brain was like the heart there was only one problem it could have it could have a heart attack mm -hmm. um, and cells would die mm -hmm. but in fact it can also have what we call arrhythmias you know it can be out of sync and we can now use energy and I mean very natural forms of energy, like sound, light, um, very, very, very low levels of electrical energy to non-invasively um, resynchronize the brain in a lot of these conditions and give people some pretty, pretty, pretty quick relief. People who were told they would never get better. Yes. Yes, and that's the miracle of some of the stories in here, and I want to get to some of those, but I, I want to lay a little bit more groundwork about the laws of neuroplasticity. Uh, we talked about this, the, how the neuron is structured and the fact that it sends electric signals, both um, uh, inhibitors as well as, as uh, uh, signals. Excitator, exc excitatory and inhibitory yeah. signals, yeah. Through the, through the neurotransmitters, uh, passes through the synapse. But one of the fundamental laws is that neurons that fire together wire together. And we used to talk about that in classes of mine, about neural pathways, that mm -hmm. uh, when people learn something, then they burn a neural pathway. Yes. And so we can make new circuits by timing of input. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, if you want to make a circuit for, let's say, I, I'm reading a story to my son or grandson, but the man with the yellow hat. Um, some neurons in the visual cortex pick up yellow and they fire. At the same time that the child sees his picture on the page, there's the shape of the hat and the man's long, thin, mm 
body. So long and thin neuron detectors fire, yellow fires, um, hat, which is a kind of a meaning about an object, fires. Those three groups of neurons fire at the same time. And they begin to compose a circuit for the man with the yellow hat. Um, and if you feel anxious, and instead of talking through your feelings and figure them, figuring them out, you immediately go for a drink or cocaine or something, and you get a, a reward for that, those neurons all get fired together. Anxiety is relieved by getting a hit of cocaine, mm -hmm. and you develop circuits in your brain for a bad habit as opposed to a, a neutral habit. And so neurons that fire together wire together. Neurons that fire apart wire apart. If you can separate various things, you can sometimes unlink circuits. And the brain is always forming and unforming and reforming circuits. It's doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you'll strengthen the existing circuit. And if that's something that's healthy, that's a good thing to do. If it's bad for you, like taking a hit of cocaine every time you're anxious, you'll strengthen a bad habit. Mm -hmm. um, but circuits are involved and interrupted in all of you know the neurological illnesses in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, even if the ultimate cause of the neurological illness is not a circuit cause, like let's say it's a pop blood vessel in the brain and you you know you have a bleed in a stroke it will still affect the cir interrupt circuitry and if it you have a stroke in the part of your brain involved in forming words to speak you'll be left with um an aphasia an inability to speak mm -hmm. and but you can use neuroplasticity and i describe that in both of my books to develop areas adjacent to the damaged neurons and get them to take over the task. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue into the first example, uh, Michael Moskowitz dealing with chronic pain. I was fascinated especially by the idea that chronic pain is learned and it doesn't just live wherever the injury is in the body but in the brain as well. So let's talk about what uh, Michael Moskowitz discovered and how he used that to deal with chronic pain. Sure. So, you know, just a few words about the different kinds of pain. You know, acute pain is when there's injury to a limb or a part of the body, and it sends a signal to the brain. That signal has to pass through a number of gates, which have to be open, for the person to feel pain. Those gates can sometimes be closed. When Ronald Reagan was shot, he didn't look like he was in pain. He didn't even know he was shot. Um, in fact, he joked after. He said, you know, I'd been shot many times in the movies, and I always acted as though it hurt. But <laughs> when I was really shot, mm -hmm. I understand, understood it doesn't always. And that's because his brain simply turned off, turned that gate off. And this happens in, in battle, too. Sometimes soldiers are shot. They don't feel it until they get to a medic. It's kind of a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. now, but in general, you have pain. In ordinary life, if you've injured a limb so that you won't move it and cause more damage, that's acute pain. Chronic pain um, occurs when there's damage not only to the limb, but there's damage to the parts of the brain and nervous system involved in processing and pain. And a typical example would be if someone, I don't know, is pinching a nerve over and over again, because the brain is plastic and neurons that fire together wire together, the pain system gets better at processing pain and actually becomes what we would call hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. And um, what's happening in the brain is the, the map for proce processing pain expands. So this, here's Moskowitz's story. He had, he had two huge life lessons that led to the development of this new mental treatment for pain. Uh, he's a bit of a Huck Finnish character, and just before July 4th, a number of years ago, there was a parade that used military tanks that were stored just outside the San Rafael dump in California. And though middle-aged, he climbed up on the tank, and he went to jump off, 
and his corduroys were caught by a piece of metal, and he heard three popping sounds of his femur, the longest bone in the body, cracking. And he lay on the ground, 10 out of 10 pain, as he a, was a psychiatrist and a pain physician. And he 10 out of 10 is like being dropped in boiling oil, the way pain physicians discuss it. Mm-hmm. And he was bleeding into his leg. He would have died if the ambulance didn't get there. His leg was as big as his waist. But he discovered something as he was lying there. Um, if he didn't move for an entire minute, that 10 out of 10 pain went down to a zero. So he lived out the gate theory of pain or the Ronald Reagan experience, which he taught his residents existed. But then he saw, my goodness, my brain really can turn off pain, um, according, just as the gate theory, theory says, without medication, without injecting um, nerves with nerve locks. He never forgot that. Mm-hmm. Then he was water skiing with his daughters uh, on an inflatable tube, actually. He flipped over and he got a neck injury. It was initially an acute injury, but then it became chronic, expanding to his head, his shoulders, and his back. Eight out of ten, disabling. He couldn't work many times. Around this time, neuroplasticity was being talked about more, and he read 15,000 pages of it. And being a pain physician, he understood the following. There, it's not the case that there's just like one pain center in the brain, as most people might assume. There's actually about a dozen of them. And most of those areas, interestingly enough, don't just process pain. They dual task. So listeners may have noted that when they're in pain, they're often cranky. And that's because one of the areas processes both pain and emotion. And basically about 20% of that map that would normally process emotion gets hijacked for processing pain. Mm -hmm. So there there are other such areas you can't pay attention when you're in pain and so on and so forth. And these are dual processing areas too. He found two dual processing areas for imagery. So there's, it's strange but true that there are parts of the brain that process both imagery and pain. And he resolved, since those maps would have been hijacked, that every time he got the slightest attack of chronic pain, which was initially always, he would force himself to use imagery and imagine something. It did not matter what he imagined. But since he had never done this before, he chose to imagine something that would keep him on task. And he basically just thought of three brain scans, the brain not in pain, the brain in acute pain, which was these dozen areas with pinpricks lighting up on a brain scan, and the brain in chronic pain, where these areas light up like supernovas. And he simply forced himself to either look at pictures of these scans or imagine them, and he imagined dimming down the pain. After a couple of weeks, he had only brief moments where he didn't have chronic pain. Mm -hmm. After a couple of months, significant periods. And by the way, throughout this, he was on high doses of medication. He'd been tried on all the known heavy-duty medications for pain and complementary treatments, and they didn't touch it, or not very much. And by the end of the year of doing this, just whenever it came up, and of course, he had longer and longer pain-free periods, so it wasn't as onerous as the first number of months, he was completely pain-free and off all medication and all other treatment except using this mental visualization technique. Mm-hmm. And that's amazing. It, 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 it's just a matter of reframing how you think about things and your brain can nullify those things. And, and that's one method. And I just want to make sure that we get to as many things as we can. So I want to move quickly to your, your uh, friend, John Pepper who walked off Parkinson's disease. Uh, That was a pretty interesting story as well. Exercise basically taking care of the degenerative disorder that is so horrific to some. What he did is he he basically got a way to control his Parkinson's symptoms so that they weren't disabling. He still has Parkinson's disease. Here are the two tricks he figured out. He was diagnosed um, many years ago, tried on Parkinson's medication. It initially worked, but then he started to get bad side effects. And it it seemed to poop out as well, which, by the way, is not uncommon with Parkinson's medication after about five years. But Mm -hmm. his pooped out earlier. Um, 
In Parkinson's, a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which normally knits individual movements together and makes them automatic so that we can do something like walking without thinking or brush our teeth without thinking, starts to lose a brain chemical called dopamine and malfunction. He discovered he could use another part of his brain, his frontal lobe, if he paid attention to each individual component of the movement. So, you know, walking has got about 10 components to it. You know, you shift your weight to your left foot. You start to raise your your right foot at the hip. You swing forward below the knee. You shift your weight forward and land on your foot. Okay. He learned if he paid attention to each individual movement called conscious walking by John Pepper, he actually could do some walking. Then he learned by trial and error that it was possible to walk too much and too li- or too little. If he if he walked too much, he would not get better because um, the Parkinson brain needs a lot of rest. He found the exact dose of walking that was necessary, and in, when we walk, we trigger brain growth factors that help the brain in general to consolidate those connections between neurons, and we even trigger some new cells in the brain in areas involved in memory. Mm-hmm. And he got to the point where he can walk much faster than I can, and as long as he can walk, if you saw him walking, he looks completely normal because he's developed this workaround way of it, and he gets the benefits of walking. So the p- typical Parkinson's patient's caught in a noose. All of us need to be able to move to maintain our brains. The reason for it is that there's a, a, a complete tie-in to movement and brain health because and when animals go on long walks, they do so because they're fleeing one environment for lack of food or because there's a predator going to an unexplored territory this new environment they're going to have to do a lot of learning in and the brain responding to the exertion of walking triggers these new cells and growth factors but if you're in, you've got parkinson's or you're in a wheelchair you can't maintain your brain the normal way with these growth factors so he found a way around that and if you saw him walking you wouldn't know he's got parkinson's but if you went to his neurologist and you examined him you would see he does, he actually has the subtle signs of Parkinson's, but he he basically got his life back, mm-hmm. and he hasn't really deteriorated. Yeah, you you, you and he's off medication, by the way. Yeah, you mentioned uh, seeing him again at a very a very late age, and one of the things that impresses me about this book, and we probably won't get into that because we have so little time, and I want to talk about some of these other miracles, is how interesting the stories are behind the lives of these folks from a from a Russian Jew who walked to Israel to Moskowitz's uh, experiences in South Africa, dealing with the various changes that were going on socially at the time. Um, there's a lot of interesting mm-hmm. stories there, and that. That, to me, is a part of it, how certain people, because of their discipline, mental discipline, or the things they learned along the way in life, were able to help create and or develop these techniques. Um, But I do want to get to a couple of uh, things that that fascinated me, uh, especially uh, cool lasers and music in particular. Can we talk about rewiring the brain with light a little bit? Sure. There are two kinds of lasers. Lasers were discovered in 1960 by Theodore Maiman. Uh, The original lasers that came to light were hot lasers that can cut. Goldfinger in, I think, 63 or 64 is about to use a laser to cut James Bond in half. That's what most people think about when they think about lasers. But cool lasers, which, in other words, don't give off heat, or low-intensity lasers is another name for them, it was early on discovered, actually promote healing. They send energy to the mitochondria, which are little organelles within our cells that are like the powerhouses of the cell. They take chronic inflammation and unblock it. They also decrease pain. But most importantly, they foster healing. But the ancient Egyptians discovered, or or knew, not discovered, that light was essential for growth and healing. And in ages before antibiotics, we used light in you know the mountains to help people with tuberculosis or light, red light to help people with smallpox there's a whole history of using light to heal but that history got buried with the age of antibiotics which by the way may be ending soon with antibiotic resistance right <laughs> now lasers have been investigated intensively particularly in the east but 
now now in the West as well. And there are certain frequencies, like in the 600 range, that can actually promote healing and growth. And I describe work coming out of Harvard, Israel, and but especially clinical work coming out of Toronto, Canada, where lasers have been used to help people who've had concussions and traumatic brain injuries. And I described the case of a woman who had a traumatic, a serious traumatic brain injury post-operatively after a tumor was removed. Mm-hmm. And the, the cutting gave her a traumatic brain injury. And it, it was just, I, I won't go through all the, the, the uh, symptoms, but, you know, she simply was completely disabled, couldn't function, couldn't remember anything, uh, no balance, and so on and so forth, practically confined to bed. And with laser light shone in the back of her neck and then later on the hemispheres within a couple of months she started to reemerge from this traumatic brain injury after having been disabled for years mm-hmm. and i follow many cases who've had concussions and had improved with both uh both for traumatic brain injury and for stroke and interestingly in some cases for migraine as well yes so light can heal the music issue works this way when the brain in many, many illnesses, when the brain is damaged, the neurons are firing at an abnormal rate. We can use our senses, because the brain is plastic, to resynchronize the brain. So music, your ear, turns sound waves and the energy in those sound waves into electrical waves, which are passed into the brain. Mm-hmm. The ear is very much just like a microphone. that does the exact same thing, turns sound waves into electrical waves. Kids with autism, attention deficit disorder, many forms of dyslexia have what I call noisy brains. They're, they're poorly synchronized. Mm-hmm. Autistic kids, it's very obvious. They're, they're very frequently hypersensitive to sound. They, they've lost control, uh, or their brains have lost control uh, of input. And so... I know time is very short, but you can. I, I've seen a number of cases now where autistic kids come in with sensory deficits, sensory hypersensi- hypersensitivity to sound. You quiet that down, and you discover that they are very become very interested in relating, mm-hmm. and that's because when you're hypersensitive to sound, you're constantly in a fight or flight reaction, and it, you can, your nervous system it can't even engage emotionally. So relationships improve, and of course, you if you can't if you're hypersensitive to sound, you can't develop language properly, and language improves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is a, a, a so rich with so many wonderful examples. I, I I think about the laser examples uh, other than neurolo- neurological cures for herpes and shingles and burns and disfiguring psoriasis and and uh, osteoarthritis uh, and hamstrings and the music uh, curing autistics. Uh, is is just fascinating. I think we only have about a minute or so left, but I did want to address the fact that uh, I, I worried as I read this book with all these miraculous studies that are going on that the pharmaceutical industry wouldn't want the rest of the world to know about these cures. What do you say about that? Um, well, I can't, I can't speak for them. Um, but, you know, a number of the things that I talk about, there are no drugs for. Mm-hmm. Um, there, are no, there are no drugs to help people with traumatic brain injury, except maybe supposedly to help them sleep, but those don't really work. Uh, there's no drugs for stroke. Um, there are clot busters to, if you get a stroke, which are fantastic, uh, perhaps. Do you know what I mean? Yes. In, but th- there's no drug for autism. Um, there's no drug for learning disorders. Um, so in a civilized... and But, you, I mean... I can't say how how others are going to react to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they if they have a child with a learning disorder, they may in fact be very interested in it. Yeah. Um, but again, that's a whole other political question. Right. It, it really but is political. I didn't people, mean to get that way. <laughs> people want people people. You know, you go if you go into medicine for the right reason, you work for your patient. Right. And um, if we come across things that can help people. You know, we just have to get the word out. Yes, indeed. That's that's a great epilogue. We've been talking with Dr. Norman Doidge, who's writing a fascinating book that is cover to cover a great read. It's entitled The Brain's Way of Healing. 
and I encourage everyone to pick it up and learn more about this. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Remember that Good Books Radio is underwritten by audiobooks.com. You can try one for free. And if you don't catch us on our radio program broadcast four times a week, you can also find us on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. 